Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to try to stay on time. So George, let me know about 10 minutes before I'm done. Um, so what I thought I would start with, actually, was um, I wanted to start with what Dr. Brown spoke about earlier. And it's just a little aside from what we're going to be talking about today, which is delaying, uh, delaying Alzheimer's disease. Um, and the reason I thought it would be interesting to discuss that is because um, when he was going through that whole business with the meditation, and we were all very quiet, um, one of the things I had trouble doing was to maintain focus and remember to just focus on the breathing. What I was often doing was figuring out what I needed to do back in New York, where I have no electricity and no water and all of those things. And what, what, what was very interesting about that whole paradigm is the idea of the six breaths a minute. And the reason why the six breaths a minute is so important is if you looked at across countries and across cultures, if you look at rosary, people who recite the rosaries or uh, use the rosary or people who recite the Quran or people who meditate, six breaths a minute seems to be the optimal breathing that's necessary to keep your brain at an optimal state of alertness and calm. And now why is that? And I thought about this a bit. And what is interesting is we're all so used to our adrenergic, sympathetic nervous system that gets our hearts racing, that gets us into a position of being very alert and focused and being able to perform in short bursts. But just as much and just as important is the parasympathetic nervous system which supplies you know, the heart and, and various other organs and functions as an additional conduit, just as powerful, far more mediated by visceral impulses that feeds into your basal brain, into your core brain. And what that does is that it's optimally activated at six breaths a minute. So it's kind of interesting that the whole concept of this mediate, meditation, et cetera, all that does is it optimizes your parasympathetic nervous system. And it gets it to a state of optimal relaxation, which actually is also the state of optimal mental alertness, and not really a state where you're kind of sleepy, but more a state where you can focus and perform. So I just thought it was kind of interesting, and I really loved that talk by Dr. Brown. So anyway, today what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about um, memory and particularly Alzheimer's disease. And looking at different types of memory, I'm going to be talking about it more this afternoon. And all of you will have a little exercise testing your own memory, your own cognitive abilities. Um, but I just wanted to briefly say to you that there are two types of memory that all of us possess in this room. One is memory for procedures, which is called procedural memory. It's memories for you know, how to dance, how to move, how to read. That's procedural memory. Then there is memory for facts and events, which is called episodic and declarative and semantic memory. It all fall, falls under the rubric of declarative memory. Declarative memory is housed in a different part of the brain from procedural memory. The good news for all of us is that procedural memory does not really diminish as we get older. Declarative memory, but particularly a certain type of declarative memory, which is memory for episodes and events, tends to get worse as we get older. And, and the loss of declarative memory, particularly episodic memory, which is what did you have for breakfast yesterday? Where were you two weeks ago? Where did I put my glasses, which I just took off? Those are def defined periods in time, episodes, that is what gets erased, and that's what gets erased in Alzheimer's disease. That is what gets erased in all of the dementias. And that is what we all fear as we get older. So what I'm going to talk about today is really how um, we can prevent that type of memory loss. Um, and we'll also look at risk factors for that type of memory problem. All right. So to start off with, this is just an old study from Evans's group in Boston. And there he looks at all the cases of various types of neurodegenerative diseases 
And as you can see, Alzheimer's disease is by far the most common. This is a very old slide. So on this slide, you don't even see dementia due to Lewy bodies. But in fact, Lewy body dementia is the second most common type of dementia. Um, and it's not on this older slide. The way I think about it is one out of every nine people over the age of 60 will develop a dementia. And one out of three people over the age of 80 will develop a dementia, um, will have a dementia, in other words. So the risk is very high, and the prevalence obviously increases as we get older. Um, this is another study. This is from the Euroderm uh, Euro study. And there they looked at a very, very large number of patients. If you look at the cohort over here, um, oops, if you look at the cohort, you can see that there's a very large number of patients in that group. You know, I would say, what, uh, almost 18,000 patients, if I did, did, did my math right. And you can see that in that group, um, the incidence of dementia is quite high, and particularly Alzheimer's disease. Now, if you look at the risk factors, and I'm going to go over each risk factor in and of itself, and if you have questions, please ask me toward the end. If you look at the risk factors, the first risk factor that's high that causes, that gives you risk for Alzheimer's disease is family history. Now, we've, I've actually republished in archives a few years ago, archives of neurology, looking at family history of Alzheimer's disease and how does that increase risk for um, developing dementia in the children? So if I had one parent with Alzheimer's, what is my chance of developing Alzheimer's? Well, the answer is it depends. It depends if my parent had Alzheimer's, that is early onset Alzheimer's disease, which is Alzheimer's before the age of 60, or late onset Alzheimer's disease, which is Alzheimer's that began in the parent after the age of 60 or even 65. So early onset Alzheimer's disease is a completely different animal. It is um, inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, which means that 50% of us will go on to develop the condition. Whereas late onset Alzheimer's disease, which is the vast majority of Alzheimer's disease that we will encounter in our practices, is a multifactorial illness. It can be tinkered with, so much so that you can have a pair of identical twins, one of whom develops late onset Alzheimer's disease and the other doesn't. So for example, in our study, we found that the rate of developing late onset Alzheimer's disease was somewhat higher when you had a parent with Alzheimer's, 18%, versus if you had no parent with Alzheimer's disease, your rate was 13%. So it really wasn't that much of a difference and my um, discussion in my patients who are coming in to reduce risk for Alzheimer's, as will be your discussion with your parents, uh, with your patients who are coming in um, to discuss that risk, re risk reduction, is what can you do to alter that risk? How can you improve your odds so that it's closer to the norm for the population or even lower than the norm for the population? Um, and I'll go over that in a minute. The other issue is the issue of gender, male versus, male versus female. Depending on who you speak to, a significant proportion of people feel that women are at higher risk for Alzheimer's disease, even after controlling for the fact that women live longer. And there are myriad theories being advanced for this. You know, people feel it's because women now are living uh, up to a third to half their lives without the protective effects of estrogen, whereas uh, 100 years ago, women were dead by the time they were 50, which was coincidentally about the same time, the average woman, I mean, uh, was about the same time that we go through menopause. Um, so there, there, but then there are other people who feel that there's no increased risk. I am of the camp that women are at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease as we get older.